So, uh, welcome everybody. Welcome all the students that have already joined us and the students that are going to join us. It's a great pleasure for me and for Antonella Campanini to welcome tonight in this session of our conferences, Professor Laura Pepe from University Statale di Milano, that uh, is a great expert in uh, ancient law, in particular Greek law and Roman law, and has uh, recently released a fantastic book about uh, wine in the antiquity, in the Greek world, and this has been the occasion to invite her to present this book to our students that under many points of view are interested into wine and into the culture around wine. Laura has uh, trained herself into ancient law with Eva Cantarella, who is probably one of the most uh, well-known professors of ancient law in Italy and uh, has a great history also as an author on the papers and an author of books about the antiquity and is one of the persons that definitely have been able to bring antiquity into the modern times thanks to her books. So we are really, really pleased to welcome Laura here tonight. You can see her during this presentation. You will be absolutely invited to ask your questions after uh, she ends her presentation that will start in a minute using some slides. But if you uh, miss Laura just a few minutes after her presentation, you can see her on Focus Channel tonight <laughs> because Laura is also a TV star on yeah. Focus Channel <laughs> presenting, uh, uh, broadcasting an in a, a very interesting format about antiquity and the everyday life of antiquity and the problems that are um, in the everyday life of antiquity. Therefore, if you are not satisfied with uh, what you are going to listen tonight, you have a second occasion during the same, <laughs> same evening. So thank you very much, Laura. I leave you for all, and I do thank you for your coming tonight to Polenzo. Well, thank you, Mika and Antonella. Also, I, the pleasure is mine, of course, to be here with you uh, this evening and probably tonight with uh, yes, my documentary about gladiators at 9.15. So the ad is done. <laughs> okay. So uh, the title of, uh, of my talk tonight is The Wine as a Mirror of Greek Culture and Society. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to just to read that, that uh, for the mere um, reason that this way uh, my talk is going to be faster. Uh, and I promise I won't talk for more than 45, 40, maybe 45 minutes. Uh, so the focus of this talk of mine today is wine in ancient Greece. I won't consider wine as a beverage. This means that you're not going to learn anything about the cultivation of grapes the variety of wines or the techniques used to make wine. My aim is to explain from a social, anthropological and political perspective what wine meant for our ancestors, in which circumstances was it consumed, why and in which way was it considered a sign of a characteristic identity. We will talk especially of Athens, and this is quite normal, since the knowledge we have about ancient Greece is mostly Athenocentric. And still now, if you go to visit Greece, when you will, uh, will be able to go to visit Greece, you will go to Athens to see the Acropolis and the Parthenon uh, or the Agora, where philosophers, politicians, common people used to meet each other every day. Anyway, we are not beginning from Athens. Instead, our starting point is an episode of the Odyssey, the poem attributed to, to Homer that belongs to the archaic period of Greek literature, uh, let's say around the 8th century BC, uh, when I will talk about the classical period, uh, just so you know, this period is later and is normally identified with the 5th to 4th century BC, hence at least 300 years later. So the episode of the, of the Odyssey I want to talk to you about is very popular, familiar even to those who know very little 
the history and literature of ancient Greece. The main characteristic of this episode, which can be read in the ninth book of the poem, the Odyssey, I repeat, are, of course, Odysseus, uh, which is called also Ulysses, and Polyphemus, the Cyclops. Uh, let me just uh, show you. OK, thank you, Michele. Let's briefly recap the background of this well-known scene. After the destruction of the city of Troy, which was uh, wrecked down thanks uh, to the famous uh, Trojan horse uh, built by Ulysses himself, all the Achaeans, uh, namely the leaders of the Greek army, went back to their homeland. Ulysses were some was somehow condemned to wander across the sea for 10 years, and during that time, he had a lot of uh, both pleasant and unpleasant adventures. One of the unpleasant ones was among the Cyclopes, uh, savage people who did not eat bread, did not obey any law, did not even live together in a structured and organized community. When Ulysses and his comrades uh, reached the, their country, they immediately understood that something was wrong. They saw a huge monster with just one eye in the forehead who was grazing his sheep. And uh, it's needless to say that herding or grazing is a sign of an underdeveloped society that has not yet become acquainted with agriculture. Ulysses uh, takes uh, 12 of his uh, bravest mates and goes to the cave where Polyphemus lived. Inside the cave, there were only different kinds of cheese namely food made of milk and as we will see in a short while this detail is crucial when polyphemus came back from the great thing together with the sheep he locked the entrance of the cave with a huge rock realizing that ulysses and his friends were inside he asked them questions and you can read uh, the question on your side strangers who are you Whence do you sail over the watery ways? Is it on some business or do you wander at random over the sea, even as pirates who wander, hazarding their lives and bringing evil to men of other lands? These few words tell first Ulysses and then tell us everything about the character and the personality of the Cyclops. Let's try to understand why. In the Homeric world, there is no statute, no written law. But this does not mean that that word is wild and that the only law in force is the law of the jungle. The Homeric heroes abide by specific rules of conduct shared by the entire community. Only the one who obeys these common rules can be considered part of a civilized society. Well, one of these rules was about hospitality. Okay. The rule, the rule about hospitality recommends that when a stranger knocks at your door, you, as a host, have just one thing to do. Welcome the stranger without asking who he is and where he comes from. Second, you must give him some wine and some roasted meat, and then you must eat and drink wine together with him. Now, the Greek word which indicates a stranger is xenos, but xenos is not necessarily a negative term, as it is, for example, for us, for example, in the word xenophobia. As a matter of fact, xenos also means guest. And it's interesting to notice that according to the Homeric rules, a stranger, a xenos, can become a xenos, a guest, throughout the execution of all the steps prescribed, prescribed by the welcome procedure. So not asking the identity of the stranger himself, giving him roasted milk and wine, uh, roasted meat and wine, and eat and drink with him. Wine, as you see, has a central role in this procedure. When you put a cup of wine in the hands of a xenos, that xenos is no longer a stranger. He becomes instead a guest. However, only uh, after this complex, uh, complex welcome ceremony, which could last even a few days, the host could ask about the identity of his guest and the reason of his travel. 
Then, after promising him help in case he needed it and giving him presents to bring home, the host and the guest established a strong relationship of friendship, mutual aid and hospitality. The Greeks called it Xenia. And this relationship was aimed to last generation after generation. This is, this is quite important since the Xenia is the earliest stage and example of what will later become a treaty of international alliance. After these necessary excursus, we can now go back to the Cyclops. As said, the first thing Polyphemus does when he realizes that some strangers are hidden inside his cave is to ask them who they are. First a wrong step, first a sign of alert and danger. Polyphemus does not even know the basics of Xenia, which, as we just saw, impose not to ask the identity of the stranger. Moreover, Polyphemus is suspicious. His first guess is that Ulysses and his friends are evil men, are pirates. Polyphemus is wild, and in his imagination, all the other living beings cannot be else but wild. What happens next is a further, stronger confirmation of uh, Polyphemus, let's call, let's call it this way, ignorance of the fundamental rules of a civilized world. After listening to, to Ulysses' reply, he takes uh, two of his friends, smashes them on the ground, tears them into pieces, and finally, it's them, raw, as a mountain nurtured lion, says Homer. Moreover, in order better to digest his meal made of human flesh, he drinks unmixed milk. Also, this detail is crucial, like the one about the cheese the cave was full of. The inversion of the rules of the Xenia could not be more complete. Instead of inviting his guests to a banquet and serving to them food in the specific form of roasted meat, Polyphemus is eats alone and makes food out of his guests. The banquet he prepares is a gruesome one in which the guests take part in the form of food, better of raw, not even roasted meat. Again, the Cyclops does not drink wine. The only thing he drink, he drink is milk. But what's wrong with milk? Well, milk is something he gets directly from the sheep he lives, he lives with. Milk is a beverage immediately available, which does not require any manufacturing process. But this is not the beverage you're supposed to drink at the end of a banquet. A banquet could not be a banquet in its proper sense without wine. And wine is not only a manufactured product, but it's also a gift given to the human beings by a god, Dionysus. So it's not a gift from nature like milk. Moreover, Homer tells us the milk he drinks uh, is unmixed. What does this mean? Why does Homer add this detail since it's quite normal not to mix milk with anything? Needless to say that the Greeks did not know coffee. We will find it out after discovering the trick Ulysses uses to win over his enemy. While heading to Polyphemus' cave, Ulysses brought some precious and very strong wine. A wine that needed to be mixed with 20 parts of water. Now, we have to remember, but we will talk further about this topic, that the Greeks, as well as the Romans later, used to mix wine with water. Normally, the mix was made of one part of wine with three parts of water. This helps us understand how strong the wine Ulysses took with himself was, because it needed to be mixed with 20 parts of water, not just three or four or two. Now, Ulysses uses, it as, uses this, that wine as a means of revenge against the Cyclops, but he does not mix it with anything. Wasn't it true that Polyphemus used to drink unmixed? And here the explanation why Homer uh, added this detail. For this reason, Ulysses serves the wine pure, undiluted, and he serves it to a teetotaler individual. Polyphemus' reaction, as soon as uh, he tasted that wine, was enthusiastic. 
He says he never tried anything so delicious. He wanted more and more. Price he drank, or for a better translation of the original Greek test, price he swallowed up, and of course he immediately got intoxicated. Then, after, after throwing up all the food he had eaten, he fell asleep. We are not interested here in what happens next. In the well-known way, Ulysses finally takes his revenge when he decided to blind Polyphemus with a sharp red hot pole. But here you can find a picture. No, sorry. OK, this one. You can find a picture of Polyphemus' revenge. This is a very famous picture found on a Greek pottery. Um, we, uh, what we are interested in here is the peculiar and significant role wine has in this Homeric tale. Wine is a beverage of the civilized community, as we have seen in discussing Xenia, and it is uh, it itself a sign of civilization. This means that both the one who does not drink wine and the one who gets intoxicated because he does not know how to drink wine properly, like Polyphemus, is inferior. He does not belong to culture, but to the wildness of nature. But it is now time to leave Homer, take a leap of at least centuries, and start talking about classic Greece of the 5th century. Classic Greece. And my first question is, does Polyphemus take a not as a mythical creature, but as a symbol of uncivilization? Does Polyphemus exist also in classical times? And if so, whom should he be identified with? Let's first say something important. In the word of Homer, there is no opposition between East and West, between Greece and the rest of the world. Both the Achaeans, namely the heroes and leaders who came from Greece, hence from the West, and the Trojans, the one who lived in Troy, Asia Minor, hence in the East, so I was saying both the Trojans and the, and the Achaeans worshipped the same gods, lived in the same way, ate the same food, drank, drank the same wine. They shared also the, the same codes of behavior. They knew the same rules about hospitality. In short, in Homer, there was no position between, between the two words. The opposition between in East and West began to appear and to be felt many centuries later, in particular after the Persian Wars that at the beginning of the 5th century opposed the Greek cities to Persia. The final defeat of the Persians, in fact, made the Greek realize that they were radically different from their enemies. And this picture of the... No, not this one. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the order is kind of inverted. And this picture of the movie 300 makes a clear that the difference. Here, the Persian king Xerxes is incredibly tall, huge. He looks like a monster. He is a symbol of excess, quite like Polyphemus. The Greeks, unlike the Persians, were free. They were not slaves. They were equal in the eyes of the law, not subject to a ruler who had over them an unlimited power. They did not obey an apt leader, indicated by the Persian with the phrase king of the kings. Instead, they took decisions together in every circumstance. They belonged to civilization, whereas the others did not. In a word, the Greeks were Greeks. All the others, hence not just the Persians, but all those who did not share the social, political, ethical values of the Greeks, were barbarians. The very Greek word barbaros, we, that we can translate with barbarian, expresses the essence of these people. Barbaros is an, an onomatopoeic term which reproduces the incomprehensible and undistinguished sound, barbar, of the animals, so different from the logos, the reasonable word, of a serious and real human being. So, their uttering of non-human words and together their lack of logos, uh, mens in Latin, means that barbarians do not even belong to a human word. And 
they live as, as animals and as monsters. But what has this to do with wine? A barbarian was not only recognizable by his language, by the way he spoke. He was recognizable also by his behavior in several social occasions. And one of these was about drinking. Here we can realize how close the similarity between the barbarians and Polyphemus is. In fact, exactly like Polyphemus, uh, the barbarians are not even by far familiar with the basic rules that allow people to drink wine with propriety. As we have seen, in the tradition of the Greeks, wine needed to be diluted with some parts of water. We will consider at a due time the various reasons of this practice, but for the moment it's enough to say that dilution was a sign of moderation, that moderation was, which was typical of the Greeks, and was later celebrated also by the Roman philosophers. Just think about the Aurea Mediocritas, the golden mean, professed by the Latin poet Horace. The barbarians, of course, are lacking any concept of moderation. They represent excess in any, in any, in any possible form. No surprise that they were accustomed to drink just pure, undiluted wine, and accordingly, no surprise, that they, get, they got drunk very easily and very fast. There is another detail that should be highlighted. Unlike the Greeks, who are used to take little sips of wine, the barbarians, again like Polyphemus, drink amosti, a Greek term meaning that they swallow up wine continuously, with open mouth and without closing their lips. In short, the way you drink wine reveals for the Greeks who you are. If you belong to a civilized, so for, to a Greek community or not. But it's time to review, not in a negative, but in a positive way, the importance of wine and its relevance in Greek society. The first thing to remember is that wine is a divine gift, as we already said, given to the human race by one of the most powerful, but at the same time also controversial gods, of the Greek pantheon. This god, this god is Dionysus, who is the son of the king of the gods, Zeus. According to one of the best known versions of the myth, Dionysus came to Greece together with another deity, Demeter. The latter, Demeter, gave the human beings grain, teaching them how to make bread. The former, Dionysus, gave them grapes, showing them how to make wine. Bread and wine are, of course, the symbols of the beginning of civilization. They are symbols of the passage of humanity to a superior step of evolution. But uh, there is an important difference between the two. While grain and bread are harmless gifts, the same cannot be said about wine. Wine is dangerous. It can lead to insanity. It must be handled with care and with awareness. And unlike bread, it must be, it must be consumed only in peculiar, peculiar occasions. The most important of these occasions was called a symposium. We are still quite familiar with this uh, Greek term, uh, since sometimes we use it in a loose sense to indicate a congress or a seminar whose topic is not only philosophical, historical, or uh, political, also literary. As a matter of fact, the discussion about uh, a topic, a philosophical topic especially, um, was also typical, not to say mandatory, of the Greek symposium. But the original symposium was much more than that. So what was it exactly? Let's uh, start with its meaning. A symposium comes from the proposition, the Greek proposition, syn, which means uh, with, and the verb pinein, uh, to drink in Greek. So we could describe it um, in translation as a drinking party if these expressions so were for us synonymous with something messy and chaotic, with an event where everybody does what he wants. Truth is that the symposium was everything but chaotic, and even the chaotic moment was strictly organized, as we will see. A symposium was both a ritual ceremony and the social institution, recognized like such by the polis, the Greek city-state. 
And as a ceremony, as well as an institution, the symposium obeys a specific rules and has specific features, the most important of which we are not going to review. A symposium took place um, in various occasions, uh, such as the celebration of the victory in an athletic uh, or in a literary contest, uh, during a public feast, but also on normal days uh, to end a dinner party. It began after the sunset and normally went on until dawn. During a symposium, the guests were not supposed to eat. They ate before the symposium got started. The separation between drinking and eating was in fact crucial to the Greek culture, at least in classical times, not in Homer, for example. And this, it's exactly this separation that makes the symposium something typical exclusively of the Greeks. Uh, things were different, for example, in Rome. The Roman version of the symposium was called the convivium, but in the convivium, food and alcohol were mixed together with the consequence that all the rules that governed the symposium disappeared in Roman times. Unfortunately, we do not have time to discuss about the difference between the two. However, the only beverage that the participants in, in a symposium were allowed to drink was wine. Also because the Greeks in general, as a community, did not drink any other alcoholic beverage or intoxicant other than wine. And here, I'd like to digress a little bit in order to mention an interesting scholarly debate. There has been a recent attempt to demonstrate that wine was not the only intoxicant that the Greeks were used to drink. In fact, according to some scholars, beer was also common, <clears throat> and it was probably Greece that passed on the Egyptian beer-making tradition to the rest of Europe. <clears throat> Moreover, they say, <clears throat> since wine was uh, quite expensive, beer was uh, the most popular beverage, at least among uh, the poorest and the humblest uh, of the Greeks. <clears throat> now, this hypothesis has failed to convince, uh, as demonstrated, among others, uh, by a very famous passage in the Homeric Odyssey. When Ulysses uh, returns uh, to Ithaca, his homeland, he is welcomed by uh, the swineherd, uh, who is, uh, whose name is uh, Eumaios. Eumaios. Eumaios is, of course, very poor and uh, is the first one to admit that he has almost nothing to give uh, to his guest. Um, however, in offering Ulysses something to drink, it's wine that the swineherd gives uh, to his guest. Wine of poor quality, of course, uh, but not beer. This argument is itself enough to contradict the idea that some of the Greeks normally drank beer. But why did they refuse to do that? Why, since in Greece uh, there was plenty of barley, which is useless to make bread, but good enough to make beer? There are various reasons that explain why the Greeks were disgusted by beer. First of all, they, as well as the Romans later, considered beer a barbarian beverage because it was drunk by non-Greek people, for example, the Egyptians, the Phrygians, the Scythians, the Thracians. And as we already know, uh, the Greeks did not want to share anything with those inferior creatures. Second, beer was made of cereals and cereals on the one side were under the protection of a female deity, the matter. On the other side, the cereals were something handled normally by women because it is women who normally make bread. If so, cereals had the sex, so they were at, at the gender, they were feminine, and again, for this reason, inferior to anything related to men, like wine, whose deity was the god Dionysus, of course. Finally, we should also note that there is no word in the Greek lexicon that indicates beer. Were beer an everyday beverage, it should have been designated by a specific term, which is not. Instead, the Greeks had not just one, but several different words to indicate specific and local beverages made of cereals. For example, they called Zyton, uh, the Egyptian beer, Bruton, the Phrygian one. Most commonly, however, beer was indi indicated by a periphrasis, barley or rye wine. And this makes absolutely clear 
uh, that it was wine, it was to wine that the Greeks used to refer when they happened to mention any alcoholic drink. After this detour, we can now go back to our symposium. We have reached the conclusion that wine, as the standard beverage of the Greeks, was the only toxicant allowed in a symposium. As we already know, the wine that was distributed to guests was always diluted with different parts of water. Drinking undiluted wine was typical of the uncivilized barbarians, whereas the habit of drinking wine mixed with water was a sign of civilization, and specifically the trademark of the Greek cultural identity. Now, it's important to notice that the dilution of wine was the first stage of the ritual ceremony of the symposium. As a matter of fact, it was performed through a series of steps. The first one was the selection at the very beginning of the symposium of a leader, uh, um, we can call it a master of ceremony. He was called in Greek the symposiarch, the symposiarch and was chosen by the most democratic mean, by lot. He was the one who supervised the symposium and established these rules uh, beginning from the decision about the proportion of the mix, namely quantity of wine versus quantity of water. He could choose for a light drink, for example, three or more parts of water with just one part of wine, or for a heavier batch. In this case, normally the proportion was one to one, or even one to two, one part of wine with two parts of water. Another significant part of the rite was the mixing itself, which was made by using specific rich recipient and basis. And here I want to show you the picture of um, this basis. Okay, so you can follow me uh, looking at the, the pictures. The first uh, um, recipient that was normally used was the crater, the crater, a term that comes from the Greek verb keranumi, which means uh, to mix. In fact, uh, the, it was used to mix together wine and water, sometimes uh, it was added to the mix also honey and sometimes also cheese. Yes, I know it sounds and looks disgusting, but as they say, the gustibus non est disputandum. So this is the picture of a cratera on the left side of your screen. Um, I think that anyone of you has seen something like that uh, in any of the archeological museum where you have been in the section pottery, of course. After being diluted inside the crater, wine was collected in another typical recipient, the oinokoe, we can call it, uh, translated this term as a pitcher, which is uh, the middle picture. Uh, thanks to the pitcher, it was poured in a cup called the Orculix or Cantaros. Again, the pictures are those on your right. And it was poured to each participant in the symposium. The distribution followed, followed a particular order. It went from, light, from left to right in the direction that allegedly would bring good luck. The second task of the symposium, after mixing the, the wine with water, was to establish the number of cups that each participant had to drink and the interval with, within each drink. To drink wine was mandatory in a symposium. This means that no one could refuse to do so. The one who didn't not want to drink had to leave the dinner before the symposium got started. Why? The answer to this question implies a variety of anthropological and religious meanings and has to do once more, one more time with the fact that the symposium was a ritual celebration, not just a messy drinking party. Wine is a, first of all something sacred. Sorry, again, I have a problem because uh, some of the slides are kind of messed up. Okay. Wine is first of all uh, uh, something sacred. It is uh, the gift of a god, Dionysus, exactly as, as we saw, grain and cereals are the gift of the goddess Demeter. And uh, as the human beings cannot live without bread, they cannot either live without wine. Both eating bread and drinking wine represented the celebration of the deities, of their power, 
of their benevolence towards the humans. But wine is not only the gift of Dionysus. The fact that, especially during the preliminary toasts, wine in the symposium is referred to as Dionysus or Bromius or Bacchus, which are nicknames of Dionysus, the god himself, indicates that wine is not just the gift of, but it's the god himself. Thus, to drink wine means to swallow, to introduce God in one's body. And since, as we said, all the symposiasts, all the participants in the symposium must drink, accordingly, they are all considered parts of the sacred communion with the God. From this perspective, mutatis mutandis, of course, it is impossible not to compare the symposium to our Eucharist, a celebration of all the Christian community where everybody is asked to eat some bread, symbol of Jesus' body, and drink some wine, symbol of Jesus' blood. So it was the, the awareness and at the same time the pride of being part of a community that required, that compelled all the symposiasts to drink together in the same way and in the same quantity. But this leads us to another important point. So far, we have seen that moderation inspired and shaped the drinking of wine in Greece, and that it was moderation that distinguished the Greeks from the rest of the world, namely from the uncivilized people whose symbol is Polyphemus, and then the barbarians who lived outside Greece. All the poets, all the philosophers who talk about the symposium recommended moderation in drinking. And here we can get to our next slide. For example, the, poet, the comic poet Eubulus, the source is the one that you find on um, the left of your screen, Eubulus, who lived in Athens between the 5th and 4th century BC, classical time so, drafted a sort of a alcoholemic chart, uh, similar to those that nowadays we can easily find in the shops, uh, pubs and restaurants where intoxicants are available. According to this chart, the ideal amount of wine that the sympodiast should swallow up before leaving the symposium was three cups. Here are uh, Eubulus' words. Three bowls do I mix for the temperate. One to health, which is emptied first, the second to eros and pleasures, the third to sleep. When this last bowl is drunk up, wise guests go home. To go beyond this limit had serious consequences. In fact, if we want to read Eubulus again, the fourth bowl is uh, ours no longer, but belongs to violence. The fifth to uproar, the sixth to drunken revel, the seventh to black eyes, the eighth is the law court, the ninth belong to biliousness, and the tenth to madness and the hurling of furniture. Another poet, Theogonis, who lived about 100 years before Eubulus, recommended to leave the symposium neither to sober, not to drunk. The best symposiast, he said, was the, was the one who was able to find his way home alone without the help of a servant. And Socrates, the famous philosopher, believed that wine was to men the same thing that rain was to plants. You can follow me by reading uh, the text that you have on the right. When God gives the plants water in floods to drink, they cannot stand up straight or let the breezes blow through them. But when they drink only as much as they enjoy, they grow up very straight and tall and come to full and abundant fruitage. So it is with us. We, if we pour ourselves in men's draughts, it will be a long time before both our bodies and our minds falter, and we shall not be able even to breathe, much less to speak sensibly. But if the servants frequently give us small cups, we shall not be driven on by the wine to a state of intoxication, but instead shall be brought by its gentle persuasion to a more playful mood. We should so conclude that temperance is the password of the regular symposiast, the one who is aware of the risks hidden in drinking too much, and who is moreover aware of the fundamental importance of behaving himself any time and any place. But if we now take a look at images like uh, these ones, uh, 
we are rightly entitled to doubt about all the things that both poets and philosophers recommend about drinking with moderation. These pictures are represented on some cubic as uh, those already mentioned the drinking cups normally used in a symposium, so that they clearly reproduce what normally happened in it. Even though I don't think you need any explanation, it's obvious that here the symposiasts are throwing up because of an excess of booze while, while somebody is helping them by holding their head. In the first case, the help is provided by a young man. Kids normally took part in the symposium as cup bearers. In the second, by a woman who is a courtesan, a prostitute. It's important to remark that only these women could be admitted into the symposium. Well, scenes like these ones clearly show a contradiction with the moderation professed by the philosophers. So what? Should we just take note of this contradiction? Or instead, should we find a way to explain it, hence to demonstrate that the contradiction is only ostensible? Let's see whether the latter question can be answered too. My starting point is the one I have already told you about, namely that the symposium is not a messy party, but it's a party that embodies in itself a chaotic, a disordered moment. Evidently, intoxication was the core of this specific moment. But in order better to understand the rationale of it, we can start with a comparison. I think any of you knows what expression happy hour means, and I bet that many of you feel nostalgic about that moment now that we are locked down because of this pandemic. I am one of the many, by the way. Anyways, happy hour is the moment of the day that puts an end to the hectic, at the, at the same time, summer time, sober time devoted to work, and marks the beginning of another part of the day, no longer hectic, no longer sober, where relaxing is not only allowed, but also strongly appreciated. Something similar to happy hour is Friday, that American people used to greet with the acronym TJIF, thank God it's Friday. The week is over, work is over, there's plenty of time to consecrate to family, to hobbies, and why not? Well, both happy hours and Fridays, Fridays are codified times of relaxation. And the same can also be said about intoxication in the symposium. There is a specific moment in it where its participant can, or more precisely, have to get high together. This is part of the ritual ceremony. Maria Luisa Catoni, who some years ago wrote a book about the symposium, has correctly maintained that there was a code of conduct within the symposium. If, on the one side, that code imposes moderation, on the other side, it contemplates also a deviance. Both the enunciation of the rule and its transgression were the essential elements of the ethics of the Greek, of the Greek drinking parties. Besides declared the rules of order, there were also undeclared the rules of disorder, thanks to which intoxication was ritualized and became an expression of civilization, exactly like its opposite, self-control. Thus, for the mere fact that it was ritualized and closed in a specific moment and in a specific space, that of the symposium, this drunkness was quite different from that of the uncivilized barbarians, who used to drink in excess always, no matter when, no matter where. Within the symposium, the Greeks got intoxicated in a civilized way. This collective drunkness, reached by all the symposiasts in the same moment, was also useful to something else, namely to reinforce the sense of community that the symposium as a ritual ceremony aimed to create. To the importance of this sense of community, I would like to dedicate the last part of my talk. To this, end, to this end, it is first of all important to remember that only free men were allowed to take part in the Greek symposium for the simple reason that they were the only effective members of the Greek political community. This means that women, or better, respectable women, were excluded from participation. 
With the respectable women, I mean women who belong to, to a family and are, uh, and are under the protection and the authority of a man, either their father or their husband or their adult son or another male relative of age, of course. The attendance uh, to the symposium of no respectable women, the called in Greek etairai, which means uh, high class prostitutes, was not only permitted but encouraged. Some of you will remember uh, that the prostitute is in here in the scene on uh, your uh, right. But I can show you another picture, there are many of them, uh, which show uh, uh, a prostitute in a tyra. It's important to notice that prostitutes were not participants like men. They were sort of ornaments of it. They were there just to sing, to play the lyre or the flute, to dance, and of course, in case, um, to have sexual intercourse with the guests. Now, the, the symposium was something restricted to men, and in this exclusively male community, it's interesting to see how the symposiums were distributed within the The place that hosted the symposium, as you can see, was a square or a rectangular room. Sorry. The participant laid down two by two on some cleanai, uh, which means uh, couches uh, or benches, disposed all around uh, the walls of the room. This means uh, that they were equally distant from the middle, from the center that was occupied just by one thing, by wine. That wine which was not only equally accessible to everybody, but equally distributed to and absorbed by everybody, so that all of them could get equal shares of it. I have insisted on the words equal and equality because they are the key words that best explain the meaning and the functioning of the symposium as a community of equal male members, but also as a Greek institution. I think that any one of you knows that equality was the most important word in many Greek cities and especially in Athens. Normally, we talk of Athens as a democracy. A Greek word was literally in Giza, the power, kratia in Greek, of the people, demos in Greek. But it's worth noticing that the ancient Athenians did not use that word to designate their constitution. They preferred to democratia the term isonomia, which means equality, iso, in front of the laws, nomos. This way, they wanted to underscore that for them it was equality the most important feature of their form of government. And this equality was well expressed by the shape of the most characteristic place of democracy. This place was called Ecclesia, or Assembly of all the Athenians. All the Athenians means, of course, all the male citizens of age. Here, Equality was stressed by the principle that anybody, the rich and the poor, the noble and the humble, the literate and the illiterate, was allowed to speak and say something useful to the city, thus contributing to the decisions that were vital for the functioning of the democracy. But the equality of the members was also signified by the shape of the building where the assembly gathered, a semicircle, as you can see from this slide. In a semicircle, in fact, all the people present are, at least ideally, equidistant from the center, and their eyes are equally conveyed towards the middle, towards the center. Now, in considering the circle-shaped architecture typical of the Ecclesia, we can better appreciate the even higher level of equality which marked out the symposium. Let's try to understand why. In the circle of the assembly, the middle is occupied by the one who decided to speak and who in that moment draws on himself the general attention. In the circle of the symposium instead, as you can see here, there's nobody in the middle. That is the place of wine and of the god Dionysus who gave wine to all the human beings. If the circle of the assembly, for example, is a paradigm of equality, the symposium circle represented the equality in his highest form. The, there is no hierarchy in the symposium. All its members know that they are on the same footing and that with their participation and obedience to the rules, they emphasize their unity and cohesion. 
Hence, in the Greek political system, and particularly in the Athenian democratic constitution, the symposium can be rightly considered the emblem of a community of peers who share, who share the same values. I know that our time is up, and I hope that this very short journey in the Greek past has helped you understand the fundamental role that wine played in ancient Greek society. In that culture, and of course not only uh, in that one, wine is a mirror of the society that produces it and consumes it. It is a grid where people who belong to the same community put in a given order the symbols that best represent themselves and the social political space where they live. It's a paradigm of their mutual relationship and of their identity. An Italian proverb sounds, tell me who you, what you eat, I'll tell you who you are. Nothing could be truer, but we should add, tell me what you drink and how you drink it, and I'll tell you who you are. This is especially true for the ancient Greeks. Thank you very much for your attention. Very much, Laura, for your brilliant presentation. I'm pretty sure that uh, our... Are you drinking wine? No, no, just water. It's a, it's a super a moment. Every hour that comes piece. next. Because, okay. I'm still after, working, but it's not yet a happy hour, after, of course. After the duty, after the time of the work, the time for, uh, the time for booze. So, <laughs> yeah. I think that our students may have questions, but I want to break the ice asking you about this last concept, because I found I found that uh, your point about the, um, the connection between isonomia, so the love of the Greeks for being equals, and the way even the place where we, they were used to drink were designed, it's incredible. It's, uh, it's like to say that being equal is always the best, not only when we have to govern or being governed, but also when we are parting, actually. And it, it seems to me that it connects very well with that point of the Greek hospitality, so unknown to Polyphem, that is never asking the guest where he comes from and why does he come, but treating him as a guy of the house, as a member of the family. That's, uh, once again, in my opinion, is a reflex of the love for being all equals. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, of course. There's a lot of things, and there are a lot of things to, to say about this point. First of all, um, it, it's not necessary, and it's necessary not to idealize, because, uh, of course, uh, the Greeks uh, normally talk about uh, equality, but uh, it's important to remember that their equality was uh, completely different from our equality. We, we have, I think, an absolute idea of equality because, of course, uh, for us, uh, everybody must be equal, uh, no matter his religion, no matter his gender, no matter his provenience. Um, for the Greeks, uh, things was, were not like that. As I, as I said, of course, uh, all the Greeks were equal, hmm? not the other ones. And of course, uh, the Greek had the slaves, so they had many of slaves, exactly like the Romans. Also Seneca, the philosopher, said all the men are equal. So yes, of course, but they had slaves, and their economy was based essentially on slaves. Okay. Uh, but um, so it's not necessary. We must not uh, idealize what equality in for for the ancient meant. At the same time, I think, uh, however, it's it's important to understand that for them and for the Greeks in, in particular, the, the Greek were, were the only people in antiquity that said for the first time we are all equals. Of course, their community with equals were was much restricted. But it was very important. Another very important thing is that isonomia was used as a paradigm and as, synony as synonymous with the democracy. But we must also remember that this is an, an aristocratic concept because uh, the symposium itself uh, is made of equal people, but normally these equal people come from the aristocracy. 
something that I uh, hadn't uh, any time to say was that the symposium uh, was also a political party where normally um, the, the participant uh, thought about a revolution because of course the aristocrats, the component of the aristocratic people was uh, um, was important in democratic events, and of course the aristocrats want to, wanted to, to uh, take government uh, uh, because they consider themselves superior to all the others. Uh, anyways, uh, I think that yes, it's important to note that first time in antiquity, the first time in the history of human beings, uh, the Greeks said, uh, okay, equality is important, we are all equals, uh, uh, we are a community of equals, and so we drink uh, on, uh, in the same way, um, there is no difference uh, between us, uh, and we belong to, a, to the same community that shares uh, the same uh, ethical values, and I think that for us, especially in, in this historical moment, uh, this is a very, very important uh, uh, argument, I think. Thank you, Laura. Some questions are starting to arrive into the chat. Yeah, and I see them. You can open them, open in the yeah. chat, see? But while you open them, may I ask you one, one thing again? See, si. yeah, of course. Yeah, because I was very curious about one thing. There is no moderation, there is no moderation into abstinence. So if you are a teetotal, you are not moderate. Of course, of course. Great, because in modern times, we tend to think that if you no. are perfectly moderate in the consumption, you are able to abstain yourself from consuming something because you were, have been able to win against your patient for that food or that drink. In the Greek vision of wine, moderation takes to be a drinker. You can't be moderate if you are not a drinker. The two opposites, the teetotaler on the one side and the one who got intoxicated regularly are on the same footing, they are equal. Of yeah. course, you need to be moderate while drinking wine. And all the philosophers say you must compare yourself with wine. You must uh, take a sort of exercise of moderation by drinking wine. Of course, they say that. And they also say, okay, sometimes a lice in sanire, semeli nanno lice in sanire. So once a time, you can also get drunk because that is normal. But there is no moderation in abstinence because it's a kind of excess, that one too. And of course, and, and you know that, of course, the Roman people say in vino veritas, but this proverb comes from, come from the Greeks because they say for the first time, enoino aletheia, hmm? aletheia means veritas in, in Latin, so truth. And of course, only when you drink wine, you reveal the real personality that you have to the other drinker. And of course, if you don't drink wine, this means that you are uh, that your real personality is hidden in your sense, in yourself. Yeah. You are something to hide, and so you and cannot yeah. reveal to the others. This brings us to to Charles Baudelaire and his famous: "If you drink just water, it's because you have something to hide." Good. Great. Good. So we go to the questions of the students. Francesca? Yes. Uh, so, since the wine was usually consumed in symposia, were you women allowed to drink it? Um, yes, of, uh, so Greek, um, let's make a, a difference. Let's uh, talk first about uh, Greek women and then about uh, uh, Roman women, maybe. In, uh, you, women, respectable women, were not invited to the symposium, but this does not mean that they could not drink. Uh, one example, for example, was, was that of Nausicaa. Nausicaa, uh, which is one of the most um, famous female characters of uh, the Odyssey, uh, when she goes uh, to, to the river because she wants uh, to, to do laundry, mm, uh, she took with herself some cheese to, to eat something and, of course, some uh, wine. Mm? So uh, it was mandatory for her and for, and for his, her friends to drink wine. And, of course, also the women could, uh, could drink wine in Greece. Of course, uh, uh, better if they do not got drunk. But respectable women could do that. It was not, uh, um, I mean, there was not no, 
uh, they were forbidden to do that. Uh, as we will see, Roman women were, at least uh, in the, the first moment of their history. No respectable women, of course, uh, uh, got intoxicated very fast, and we have the history of a uh, um, quite famous uh, courtesan, whose name was uh, Nera. Um, the orator Demosthenes uh, talks about her in one of um, uh, his uh, speeches, uh, the number 59, and yes, an era while uh, intoxicated, had sex with all the sympathias and do the, the worst things that a, a woman uh, could do. But also respectable women, however, if they drank with moderation, could drink. Um, the um, things were different instead for uh, the Roman uh, women, because Roman women, at the beginning of their history, um, they could not drink wine, because the Romans thought that wine, um, drinking wine for a woman was like committing adultery. Mm? The wine was uh, for them uh, the symbol of, uh, um, was, was compared for them to, 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 do, to the men, men sperma. So, of course, uh, they could not drink wine because it was the same as having sex with, sex with somebody different from their husband or uh, from uh, their fiancé. But at the same time, we know that uh, there was a law uh, that prohibited the uh, one for uh, the Roman uh, uh, women, but uh, this uh, law was uh, beca became uh, uh, that letter in a short while, because uh, uh, in uh, the last Republican people, for example, Roman women uh, began to drink, they loved drinking a lot, and um, there is a poet, one famous poet, which is Ovid, who gives some uh, suggestion to uh, Roman women uh, to uh, have a, a sexual relationship thanks to wine, by drinking wine. So, of course, uh, also Roman women um, could enjoy uh, the pleasures of wine, at least in the last part of their history, not in the first one. Um, are there any vestiges of ancient Greece drinking tradition apparent in contemporary Greek society? I don't think so, because normally when I go to Greece, uh, I drink wine as I drink it in Italy, but M Michele can maybe ask a question. Normally they don't drink diluted wine, I think. Today, today in Greece, I think they do drink uh, the, the, the rest of the world, but... Yeah. There is, I think there is a technical aspect of ancient world wine that can also explain the use of mixing. Because the, uh, the, the, oh, recipes, yeah, the recipes we have are, are, are thought for making very concentrated wines, Dr letting the amphoras drying in the sun for many months and concentrating mm -hmm. the alcohol. The, their goal was probably the preservation of the product. But of course, it, it went easily over 20 uh, degrees, uh, 20 degrees of alcohol, and this means it was very, very uh, easy to get drunk with that pure liquid. So the mixing governed by the symposiarch was uh, the, the perfect match between the goal of having people not getting drunk too fast, like the Schitzians that uh, used to drink without diluting, and on the other side, to use in the perfect way a product that, to be preserved, needed to be so concentrated. Today, in Greece, they produce wine as it is produced in all the Western world. Therefore, they don't need any more to recur to these kind of, uh, techniques and concentrations. But who knows? It could be a good, a good trend for the future to rediscover a wine from Kos very concentrated and made using some sea water in order to have it concentrated and salty. That you know, may be the taste of the future. But dilution, for example, is typical uh, in Greece uh, when you drink something uh, different. Uh, uh, and, and Michele, help me remember the name of uh, the... Um, uh, in, in Turkey, they call it raki. Uh, yeah, Udo. Udo, Udo. Yes, Udo yeah. normally is diluted. But yeah. because it's that's it. it's in the whole Mediterranean basin because yeah. they're made of anise, uh, <laughs> like Istral, uh, like the um, like the products like Pernod or or uh, mm -hmm. in south of France, like uh, different from Sassolino to 
uh, Anice in the south of, uh, of Italy, have been produced for being diluted and, drink, and drinking during summer particularly. And this is another tradition. I think it comes from the Arabs, as, uh, as it comes from the Arabic word, the, the use of distillation. Because actually, the great break in getting drunk is the, the, the discovery of the distilling process that was not for the ancients, nor the Romans, neither, nor the, neither the Greeks used to distillate. And mm -hmm. therefore, they, have, um, they had low alcohol compared to, to whiskey or any other distillate we can do in modern times. Mm -hmm. And they exactly. added to this and found recipes to preserve and, to, and, to, and also to counterfeit. Cato, the, the, the Roman writer, because, because sorry, also to, to be a bit fraudulent, because Cato, the Roman <laughs> writer, teaches how to make a wine of course without going to course. Of course, ah, yes, of course, that is a very nice message. That is a great <laughs> recipe. It's like today to say that I, I teach you how to do a Parma ham without the need of Parma. Of course, know? the Parmesan cheese, the very yeah, famous the, and yeah, cheese. Exactly. So, Exactly. Like that. It's like that. Let's go on with the question. Oh, by um, the sacred character of wine affects its production and trade. No, absolutely not, as far as I know. Uh, it, it, it became something sacred just inside the symposium, uh, not outside it. Because, of course, uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in my talk, I just talked about uh, the function that the wine had inside the symposium, but wine could, could also be consumed uh, outside it. For example, uh, in um, the Homeric poems again, also the warriors before going to battle uh, used to drink wine. And in that case, uh, wine didn't have anything sacred. It was just uh, used as a beverage to tie fire, to uh, give energy to the body, mm, nothing more than that. So I think, but as far as I know, of course, I cannot say if in, it's in trade, uh, but I don't think so. It was not nothing more than that. How can Greece is no longer associated with good wine in particular? Yeah, this, there is, this is not the first time that we question. There is, a, there is a question before by Khalid that to me is very interesting. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Good evening. Yeah, no, 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 well. There is a connection with the religion. Uh, this didn't go the reason why wine still today is considered a drink for <laughs> cultured people. Yeah. Oh, but I think so because uh, um, I don't know because I, I I'm I'm not a religious people a, a person so I don't I don't I, I cannot really answer. But no, I don't think. But that the the the, 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 the link between religion and uh, and wine is uh, it's it's important now. I think that uh, culture and wine are more important than that. Um, but we can also say, Laura, if you agree, that uh, the fact that in Christianity wine has been has been put in a position that is important. representation of the blood of God, uh, protected wine against an equal treatment to any other alcohol. We see it even today when there is an attempt of regulating booze. Mm. Uh, wine makers always say, but wine is not alcohol like any other alcohol, you know? Yes, but it's just a say, it's just a say. I don't think that more, I mean, when people drink wine, they don't think that it's something religious and sacred. They no, drink wine right. like it. <laughs> and, and this is the reason and so. Also You're because, right. Is, uh, I don't know, the Vatican City should be the most important producer of wine, and I don't think so. But however, yes, of course, but Michele is right when he says that, that wine is uh, in the religion, in the Christian tradition, of course, is a very well, important uh, beverage because it represents uh, the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, and so, of course, uh, all the priests, I think, that normally drink wine. You cannot see a priest who doesn't do that. <laughs> it would be impossible for them. Yeah. Well, and my question is, uh, but what if if you have a two taller, two two taller uh, priest, uh, it's impossible. Yeah, there is no. You can like, celebrate yeah. the mass. The mass. No, I think at the moment no, because the wine are regulated by the canon, by the the, the code of the Vatican imposes to use uh, wine made in a traditional way, so non-dealcoholized, 
and uh, and I don't know if they are going to int introduce the hypothesis of wine without alcohol. They have already introduced uh, the bread for celiacs. Okay, you can have the you can have the bread during the mass without mm -hmm. uh, without yes, gluten. Exactly. Mm -hmm. made made uh, in a way that is not harmful for celiac. But I think that Khalid is right, underlining the fact that even today, beer is for blue collars, when wine remains a bit for white collars. I mean, there is something that let people think that wine is a bit more for cultured or upper class people when beer is not the same. I think that maybe also it's something more in the northern countries. In Italy... Yeah, but I don't think that it has to do much with religion. Yeah, it, it's probably not linked to religion. I agree, I agree with you. Yes, it's, 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 it, it has to do a lot with culture, because, for example, if you... But do, do you know, I, I remember that while writing this book, um, uh, Heroes Drink Wine, um, I, 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 I read a very interesting article about experiments done uh, by a researcher who went to a bar and um, asked for wine, for beer, for whiskey, and uh, they, he, he realized that uh, the waiter uh, went with, without knowing who ordered beer, wine, whiskey, um, brought the beer to the um, younger, younger, youngest people. Um, wine mostly to female people, whiskey to men. So all, all the beverages are somehow gendered. They have a gender. And they have also um, an age. Mm? So if you are young, you're supposed to drink beer. If you're old, you're supposed to drink whiskey, especially if you're a man. If you are a, a woman, you're supposed to drink just wine and preferably white wine instead of red wine, because red wine is uh, for, for male. male. For men, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. this is interesting, however. Yes, a culture has to do with wine. I don't think about religion, um, but no. I don't. I don't know. Probably, probably yes. I don't know. It's very interesting. Last question from no, Ricardo. I was saying that the last uh, question about Ricardo. It's not the first time that I uh, receive uh, this question. How come Greece is no longer associated with good wine in particular? And when they have such an ancient history, when they have such an ancient history of it? Well, the first time that I was asked to answer to this question was in Rome exactly two years ago, uh, during my presentation of the book. And I say, because uh, I, I don't know, because the Greeks had Actually, they have a terrible wines. So, so, for example, I remember Tina. And one Greek people. <laughs> Don't say so. <laughs> and one Greek, there was one Greek people uh, uh, who stood up and say, no, it's not true. We just, just don't, we, it's not true that we just have Retina. We also have a, a lot of uh, delicious wines. Yeah. Unfortunately, I never tasted any of them. So normally when I go to Greece, I don't drink, drink wine and I hate Retina. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but just because I don't know what other kinds of wine do they, they do I have, but it's my yeah, but, game. yeah, Ricardo, I think that your question can find uh, can find a partial explanation in the he recent history of, of Greece. Remember that Greece have been part of the Ottoman Empire of since so. since the 13th century up to the middle of the 19th century. And therefore, in large part of the of the area, it was not allowed to cultivate the grapes and to and to produce wine. And the commerce of wine was not uh, nor easy and in part not le not legal. Therefore, the renaissance of Greek wine have started later. Now, the problem, the biggest problem, is probably the climate change because Greece is becoming hot, um, even more hot than Italy, and. Um, and they are uh, they have to cope with it but i invite you to check because there are many producers particularly in the isles and particularly in the isles uh, of the aegean sea and in crete that are gaining be uh, very good awards year after year so you can discover very good wines even in greece mm -hmm. uh, 
say something in defense of Retsina. Retsina is a very traditional product. It stinks like the things you use to, to, to clean after that you are painted. But uh, it's, it's <laughs> is it not traditional. Okay? In Italian, it is called acquaraggia. In Italian, acquaraggia. Mm. Because it's the pine of the uh, Aleppus, uh, it's the resin of the pine from Aleppus joined with oh. white wine to have this taste. I actually don't know the origin of the product, but uh, as, a, as a passionate of legal regulations about wine, I must notice that in the whole European Union, if you mix something with wine, you cannot call it wine anymore mm -hmm. with a single exception. The Greeks. Sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. What retina? Only retina, only retina mm -hmm. can be legally called wine in Europe, even if they have added something different to the wine. Wine. In any other case, you are not allowed. You have to say drink made of wine plus something else. In the case of retina, the Greeks obtained the privilege to call it wine in consideration of the rich history behind this product. The taste is peculiar, but the history is great, actually. Yeah, however, Ricardo, if you go through Greece and drink beer, it's better than any kind of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. Antonella, do you have No, no, purtroppo le mie competenze inglesi anglofone sono insufficienti per tutto questo. Però è stato interessantissimo e ti ringrazio in particolare perché hai ripreso parecchi aspetti che ho trattato solo en passant durante il mio corso. Ti ringrazio molto. Quindi, la... Grazie davvero perché grazie. è stata un'occasione di approfondimento di determinati argomenti che avevamo visto così mi interessa molto comunque la mia impressione Michele è per concludere che la resina possa essere solo che migliorata se le aggiungi qualcos'altro e quindi sì, può darsi che il disciplinare dipenda da quello potremmo, potremmo metterci anche del, del formaggio we can add some cheese and also maybe some honey and something else you can taste better you underestimate the case that Rezzina has been made this way because you cannot get drunk with Rezzina. It's, no, I, I, no, 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 I got it's drunk. Impossible. It's not true. Ah, you're it's speaking, not true? No, you're speaking not true. You're not speaking the truth. Because <laughs> after two, 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 two glasses of Rezzina, you can, you, you are high, so you're, you're happy. High. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and in this way, you forget the taste. <laughs> so. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's one. The reason is that one. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thank you. So much. Thank you. It has been such a pleasure. Thank you, Antonella, for organizing. Grazie, Laura. Grazie a tutti. Grazie Thank mille. you. Baci. Have a nice evening. And don't forget on Focus tonight at 9.30. E guarda che lo devi guardare anche tu poi, eh? Yes, I will. 9.15. 9.15 tonight, Gladiators on Focus Channel. It's uh, 50... 50 35. 35. 35. 35. Ah, 35. 35. ah, thank you so much for this information. <laughs> Bye. Bye, grazie. Bye, Bye everybody. Ciao, Michele, grazie. Ciao, Antonella. Grazie mille. Ciao, ciao, grazie. Ciao, Ciao. Bye.